Chapter Twenty of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty. We must be about there, Ross said. Barry Lynn. Both men looked out of the Kaipara train upon a narrow tidal creek that wound a serpentine course about a great waste of mangrove flats. Beyond them, a line of shining sand hills suggested beaches and the open sea. From the Kaipara harbour as yet out of sight came a pungent salty smell pleasantly mingling with the freshness of the spring morning with spasmodic jerks that rattled the teeth in the jaws the train slowed down to the helensville station where the long-suffering passengers with an air of extreme thankfulness gathered up their parcels and scrambled out the people who passed through helensville belonged with but few exceptions to the desperate the disappointed the sanguine and the disillusioned the desperate headed for the northern gum fields as a last resort the disappointed were teachers or members of the civil service ordered to such minor positions as third-grade post offices or inspectorships the sanguine were farmers or fruit growers confident that the soil only needed their special attention to yield up its share of riches and the disillusioned were those who had passed that way before nobody ever stayed in helensville except the people who failed to make connections between the steamers and the trains. They constituted a floating population upon which three hotels and two boarding-houses flourished. Nobody ever lived in Helensville, except the people who had failed to make a living anywhere else. Everybody who went through it was told the old gag that its name should have ended with the first syllable, but there was no evidence that in that event it would have rivaled its famous namesake for interesting company. It might have done better with regard to climate and to smells. Alan Ross sniffed on the station platform. Let's see how soon we can get out of this, he said. A chain or two away, one of two small steamers, lying against a wharf that was merely an extension of the station grounds, now emitted columns of smoke and whistled ostentatiously. The two men followed the passengers from the train, who all hurried towards it. On the way, Ross singled out a tall, gray-haired man. Pardon. Can you tell me where these steamers go? he asked. Taking his pipe from his mouth, Bruce looked cautiously into the stranger's face and at that of his companion. Certainly, he replied, one to the Wairoa, one to the Otamatea. Which goes first? Bruce smiled, realizing some element of chance, but he had no presentiment of how much. The Otamatea boat, as soon as she can get away. That's in about a quarter of an hour. Thanks. Any settlements up there? Yes. Could we camp and get boating and fishing? Yes, anywhere. That sounds as if it might suit. With an interesting nod, he turned to Lynn, and Bruce walked on. Shall we sell it that way, Barry? By all means. They hurried back to the station to make the necessary arrangements about their luggage, and when the Ethel, delayed on their account, finally got away, the two men, with all their belongings, were on board. The passengers, with a sense of selection peculiar to travellers by boat, soon arranged themselves according to their social and commercial grades a government inspector to whom all northern doors were open began to talk to a landowner and his two daughters who to the envy of their own sections had just made their annual shopping tour to auckland near them the commercial traveller without whom no boat or train ever got anywhere in new zealand listened to their gushing with mingled feelings of boredom and amusement five saddened teachers who had vainly hoped for moves back to civilization, talked heatedly of the unfairness of the recent examinations, and confirmed each other's idea that the Board of Education needed to be tidied up. Seated on a coil of rope, dressed in cheap new ready-made clothes and soft hats, the hallmark of the comparatively prosperous searcher after work, sat two men, who had already, with native cunning, picked out Bruce and the landowner as possible employers of casual labor. Down on the lower deck, by the toy hatchway sat two seasoned gum-diggers, maudlin and nervous, after a giddy week in Auckland, and near them, as if conscious of kinship, sat a curved and shrunken figure, with a brand-new gum outfit beside him, who was heading for the gum-fields as a last resort. Those who knew the ropes gave him the benefit of a second glance, for, though drink and general misery had drained the individuality out of him, he might, as far as their previous experience went, have been anything from a book-black to a university professor, or the son of an earl. It was his horrible cough, rather than the pitifulness of his latest profession, that first attracted Bruce. A pioneer family, 
munching black balls and bananas was huddled together also on the lower deck to the shy and awkward children the voyage was an adventure beyond their grasp to their sanguine parents it was part of the hopefulness of the new beginning and had in it for that reason as much of a pleasant thrill as they would ever know completing the familiar elements of the human cargo a many-coloured maori group laughed and chattered in the bow with their native philosophical indifference to the turns of fortune that is the despair of the envious white man Alan ross and barry lynn both felt as they leaned against the gunwale the eyes of most of the ethel world upon them that they were the unknown quantity a splendid isolation was forced upon them for apart from bruce there was no person on board of their quality as a matter of fact their presence seemed so unusual as almost to demand an explanation bruce himself had not been able to resist another scrutiny of them as he took a privileged stand beside the captain at the wheel he wondered idly what had turned them northwards it was not the shooting season and there were no trout streams worth while north of auckland he reflected but as the dark man looked cruelly used up he guessed that a desire merely for rest and an outdoor life explained their trip in that direction the little boat was now well under way twisting and turning with the creek Alan ross looked over the mangrove flats at the western sandhills with the exhausted but thankful air of one who knows he has finally outrun an enemy his head always carried high was covered with thick black hair that slightly waved his keen face which was curiously eager for a man who even at thirty knew most of the crooked ways of men was long and thin and lined it was unusually tanned for a city dweller as his whole bearing obviously proclaimed him to be it was not easy to tell at first wherein his compelling attraction lay but tired though he was his singular vitality travelled like an electric current round that little boat before they reached the open harbour every woman and many of the men could have given the details of his physiognomy and dress his friend barry lynn was built on weaker lines he was just as tall and just as straight and just as easy he was more conventionally handsome but when the two men were together the eyes of most people passed over him to ross and stayed there it was true that a larger number of women had passed their hands through lynn's soft brown hair but that was a matter of their opportunity rather than their desire lynn made a habit of succumbing to temptation ross made a luxury of it lynn could never ignore a hint many an eye had vainly flashed at ross almost any attractive woman who signalled her willingness was good enough to climb with lynn to the venus mount but ross required special qualifications in the woman who should listen with him to the birds twittering in the dawn to lynn a feeling for the dawn was not important to ross it was this was not obvious to the unsophisticated passengers on the little boat all they saw was two handsome men who they instinctively knew had got the better of the world and to those more or less helpless people who see in the world only a series of enemy powers to fight instead of a series of friendly powers to use there is nothing more wonderful than the beating of them lynn was interested in watching the passengers in return he got the tragedies and comedies of the collection without much speculation ross was not so interested he knew that there were few people on the boat who from his point of view had ever done anything worth while and so for him the passengers with one exception did not exist the exception was david bruce when at dinner time he appeared at the saloon table with the derelict who had hitherto sat ignored and apart ross found his eyes wandering again and again back to that story-telling face that is a stunning man lynn he said look at the way he's handling that wreck he has the manner of a doctor and many times during the rest of the voyage bruce found the dark eyes of the tired stranger fixed upon his face when they came up from dinner they found the whole expanse of the kaipara harbour spread out before them as they neared the heads they saw billowing up into the sky the lines of the comber wind hounded that heaved and thundered and broke upon the dangerous bar the ethel began her dreaded somersaults and though the agony was brief it temporarily changed for many their views of life after skirting the mouth of the wairoa the ethel turned into the wide mouth of the otamatea they passed several fish canning factories and an old missionary station with its rows of poplars upon the beach a clump or two of pines and the wooden fences buried between rows of huge geranium bushes running wild deserted many years previously 
it wore an old-world air of unpruned maturity and uninterrupted peace at intervals along the banks from small mori settlements clustered by little sandy beaches there came calls that were vigorously answered by the natives aboard three times the ethel stopped at toy wharves from which roads led off into the wilds after unloading cases and barrels whether there was any one to meet them or not she snorted off as if she despised these menial tasks now and then some one pointed out a collection of buildings with its familiar pine clumps as the home of some big sheepman or orchard grower about four o'clock lynn called attention to a small sailing boat that came zigzagging down the river both men saw that bruce was interested in it and that he left his conversation with the captain to watch it as with reckless daring it tacked across the steamer's bows cut through the water on the left and came round on the wind at her stern with a flourish and so alongside it's a girl exclaimed lynn in amazement then the figure at the stern stood up one hand on the tiller and the other groping the mainsail rope asia was not unaware of the fact that she was the episode of the voyage but she was so accustomed to striding her little world like a colossus that she knew it merely as a detached matter of fact and not as a matter for self-congratulation hello uncle david she called where's mother she's going to stay another fortnight they went on talking for a minute or two while all the passengers flocked to the side to admire the way she handled her little boat many who knew her kept their eyes glued upon her anticipating the coveted smile of recognition the landowner's daughters were sure that if she would only look at them she would approve their new clothes and hats and they felt a smile from her would now add to their standing for the rest of the trip but asia did not see them she was wearing a blue serge dress short skirted and open at the throat a fascinating sky-blue woolly cap perched jauntily upon her tangled golden hair the breeze flapped her skirt about her bare legs her clear skin painted by the swish of the wind told of the simple life strong nerves and beauty sleep and in her eyes there glowed the joyous spirit of the wood nymph and the water sprite neither ross nor lynn attempted to disguise his interest i say she's stunning whispered the latter why not smiled ross well here and lynn included the whole landscape in a glance why not if he is with a nod at bruce she called him uncle she looks like city to me well she sails that boat like one who belongs to the river that's true i wonder who they are lynn looked from her to bruce again ross followed his glance and he was still looking at bruce when asia first caught sight of him so he did not see the sudden blaze that leapt to her eyes nor the swift stiffening of her loosely poised body as it happened only bruce noticed after a short amazed stare at the two passengers asia avoided looking squarely at them again and soon with a parting nod at the captain and without a glance at the many who were waiting to be recognized she close hauled the sail and shot away all the way up the river she sat still once or twice forgetting to manage the wind and narrowly missing an accident in her eyes there now gleamed the vision of new adventures a premonition of great things to come as she shot away from the ethel ross and lynn smiled at each other both wondered where when and how they would meet the presiding goddess of the place again round the next bend there came into view the point curtis wharf with its good shed and trucks its two-storied hotel and store when lynn saw the little sailing boat run in and tie up to the wharf he walked over to the captain what place is this captain he asked point curtis mister is there any more of it than that lynn pointed to the hotel there are farms and the gum fields and there's the bay the bay timber settlement up the river owned by mr roland lynn had heard asia's name whispered several times among the passengers how far is that he asked matter of three miles or so up the river jerking his head to the right could we put up in tents there do you think oh yes anywhere about thanks lynn walked back to ross under fire of a volley from many a wildly interested eye let's get off here ross captain says we can camp what the devil are you grinning at we land here then smiled back his friend as the ethel drew near the wharf an amazing number of human beings rose mushroom-like in the doorways of the buildings and from boxes sacks and trucks upon the wharf itself and all as if worked by the same spring moved for the same spot with the same object in view that of being next to the gangway when it was run ashore if it had been possible to tell with precision exactly where the gangway would run out an ambitious few would have been found outlining that place to quiz the strangers 
from an unobstructed point of view and to claim greetings from neighbors and acquaintances there was in that little crowd one maiden lady of uncertain age and uncertain everything else whose chief claim to local fame lay in the fact that ever since the ethel began to make her regular trips she had been one of those who had pressed the gangway railing to their bosoms and who could have touched every passenger as he came ashore she was there now feverishly watching to see where the casting ropes would land and who would pick them up and where they would be tied near waiting traps and sledges thin patient horses stood tethered to stumps where they had for hours hung their heads in mute unfed dejection sporting dogs of mongrel breeds fought and gambled and came near to causing accidents upon the narrow wharf a number of children wheeled an empty truck along the primitive railroad their harsh screams of excitement drawing upon them the wrath of their elders the women in the little group looked as if they had been stretched out and dried on crosses in the sun and then dropped suddenly and left to curl up and contract their skins were like wizened russet apples at the end of winter storing most of the men had grown permanently tired and warped fighting unexpected eccentricities in the seasons unexpected diseases in the crops and unexpected cussedness in the soil both ross and lynn looked curiously at this unfamiliar crowd seeking the face of the girl from the boat and they finally saw her near the back at the head of the steps she met their eyes once with a look that neither of them could call even mildly interested and then she waved her hand to bruce as he had no luggage save a small handbag bruce was one of the first to step ashore the men noticed that everybody seemed to know him and that his hat was permanently raised as he made his way through the group to the steps ross and lynn stood still till all the passengers were embarked watching the sailing boat leave and continue its way up the otamatea then having made arrangements for their things to be taken to the hotel they got off leisurely and with the eyes of most of the women upon them they walked up the clay path to the hotel to engage rooms End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one the next morning the two men found their way up the road towards the bay looking for a cottage they had been told might be to let the hotel proprietor had advised them to have a house as well as their tents and the lurid picture he gave them of the uncertainty of the weather in those parts had impressed them with a the common sense of the suggestion at various places on the way they paused to look down through leafy gaps upon the river which a fast-rising angry wind was churning into clumps of froth every now and then a furious gust bore down branches in their faces and sent showers of twigs scattering in all directions there was an intoxication in the keen air that got them both by the throat unexpectedly they came upon a well-trod path leading towards the river they followed it a little way to find another branching from it and after they had stood a moment speculating they followed this new one it led into a small clearing in the centre of which they saw what they rightly took to be the cottage they were searching they picked their way over the logs stumps and brushwood there was a nice air of crudity about the small dwelling bare and unpainted and shut off from the world by its circular wall of bush ross liked it the minute he looked at it they walked round it and looking through the windows saw that it had three small rooms and an open fireplace it was surrounded with its own wood supply in profusion and for water there was a new zinc tank fed from spouting that ran round the corrugated iron roof if this is it i say we take it said ross so do i you ought to be able to write here and it would suit me fine for study i wonder how near we are to the mill what's that in a lull of the wind they heard a weird sound new to them it was the mournful shriek of one of the circular saws sounds like machinery said ross they retraced their steps to the well-trodden path they had gone but a little way down it in the direction of the river when they felt rather than heard that someone was behind them swinging round they came face to face with asia who was amused at their swiftly banished astonishment this time she did not hesitate to smile frankly into their eyes isn't it a wind she said gaily we are going to have a storm but our welcome to strangers is not always so ungracious both men felt the fire of a new exhilaration course through their veins as they looked at her she looked like the greek spirit incarnate 
her blue eyes laughed at them out of the freest body they had ever seen she was plainly dressed in a well-worn navy serge suit a comfortable thing that had modified itself to her swinging limbs and swift motions the pale blue cap of the day before nestled into her hair as if it lived there it had an impertinent air all its own on her feet were tan boots stained with mud and dust her arms swung loosely and her hands were gloveless her eyes passed over lynn to ross the expression in them changed i've seen you often she said to him without waiting for either of them to answer her remark me for a moment ross strained his memory in vain yes in sydney ah and both men felt that much was explained you know sydney asked lynn delightedly yes a little i was there two years i came back eight months ago she turned again to ross i saw you first in the domain you were speaking to a howling jingoistic mob who yelled pro bore at you but you kept on and the police rescued you i heard you speak for the labor movement many times i know people who know you the gilbert morgans you were invited to meet me one evening but you went to some meeting instead and i don't think you ever sent a decent apology he did not attempt to apologize now as his eyes smiled gleefully back at hers but after a minute he sobered wondering uncomfortably how much she knew about him the world continues to be small said lynn flippantly who are you she asked abruptly oh my friend barry lynn introduced ross the barry lynn who writes the same he bowed oh then i've read some of your stuff i'm flattered you needn't be i came across it quite by accident he laughed into her mischievous eyes may i hope that upon mature reflection you regard the accident as a happy one oh yes her tone was more casual than he liked but he met it gaily i'm sure you are a very discerning critic he said gallantly you're like that are you she retorted well i may as well tell you i'm one of those awful people whom flattery does not flatter nor deception deceive dear me said ross gravely what right have you to take the joy out of life like that she flashed a delighted look at him don't you ever lie asked lynn aghast of course that's another thing she rose on her toes and caught a branch that was about to swish into their faces what are you doing here she went on are you looking for the mill yes answered ross we want to find out who owns the cottage in there we'd like to take it for the summer oh she looked into the trees catching at another swaying branch i can tell you that it belongs to mr king a farmer who lives at kaiwaka about three miles along this main road she waved in the direction i guess you'll be able to get it he built it for his daughter who was to have married one of our men but he was drowned six weeks ago that's so well we will go after it at once then the conversation came to an abrupt stop asia plunged at swaying branches not as lynn thought because it showed off her supple figure to perfection but because the joy of life in her had to express itself in motion of some sort but after a minute or two she became aware that both men were looking to her for the initiative would you like to see the mill she asked ross we would very much come on then as the path was not wide enough for three asia stepped out beside ross leaving lynn to follow in a bad humor behind already the choice seemed significant but he determined not to be put aside i suppose we must explain ourselves ross he began but asia shot an arresting glance back at him you needn't she said curtly nobody ever does here we have duke's sons cook's sons and sons of belted earls scattered about the landscape but none of them ever explained explanations stop behind at auckland though i believe they are going out of fashion there now we don't care why you are here this is the land of the lost one of those happy spots where no questions are asked of course she added mischievously the fact of a person's being here is usually all the explanation necessary both men smiled oh well drawled lynn if you are not a bit interested well if it interests you to tell me of course as a matter of courtesy she drawled back ross could not resist laughing at his friend's bungling and at his foolishness at being hurt by her indifference why the devil should she be craving to know why they were there it was only too obvious that they were not the first men she had seen but asia had not meant to snub barry lynn so she turned to him sweetly you are copy hunting of course she said and you will find this place a storehouse of good yarns i can put you on to several thanks that will be fine he answered gratefully they walked on some yards in silence asia was really curious to know why ross was there but she did not dream of asking 
he rather hoped she was curious but as he was not in the habit of explaining himself it did not occur to him to do so now as they walked he threw his head back sniffing the wind when they broke from the bush to find themselves on a small rocky point about which the waves were lashing alan ross stopped abruptly and looked across the river at the desolate wastelands on the left bank below the turn good he smiled i wanted to get away from the world the flesh and the devil are you sure you have she interrupted him with a wicked little smile his bright eyes met the challenge in hers with a swift responsiveness but he parried the stroke i don't despair at the first sign of disappointment he shot back then she laughed merrily into the angry wind swinging round they saw ahead of them the ranges of waste timber and sawdust that spoiled the beauty of the banks for acres on the western side of the mill yards asia led the way along a maze of tramway lines into a narrow canyon walled up on either side by stacks of flitches and boards of regulation widths when they reached the end of the first wharf which was the scene of a tremendous bustle of men trucks clanking chains and donkey engines tom roland caught sight of them and came briskly forward he greeted the two men with his childish delight in a new audience and when asia had introduced them he proudly led the way into the mill single file he advised and be careful they went past the goose and circular saws and the moving platform of the breakdowns to the skids where the winch had just got to work upon a log that lay down in the booms to both men everything was new and absorbing the great framework of the double mill its solid log foundations the huge beams that held up its iron sides the big spaces overhead the accumulated roar of machinery the blur of the circular saws whizzing at terrific speed the monotonous singing of the complicated loops of belts the tremendous thrill in the air all these things got their imagination they looked curiously at the huge blackboards suspended from the crossbeams covered with figured hieroglyphics intelligible only to the initiated and at the men and boys who swung iron grips and levers in and out of the very jaws of death they watched the progress of a log from the booms up the skids to the side of the breakdown platform where with astonished ease it was jerked into position on the sliding floor halved and quartered it was then levered with resounding thuds on to greased rollers and rushed towards the big circulars which turned it into flitches then the small circulars the drag and the goose completed its metamorphosis into the regulation strips that were run on to various trucks and wheeled off each kind to its appointed pile roland then led the way to his engine room where the two finest machines in the colony as he was never tired of telling lay carefully packed in brick tended by a corps of perspiring stokers the chief engineer came forward to be introduced and to corroborate everything the boss said about the superlative qualities of his boilers his driving capacity and the excellence of all the appointments after he had said all he usually said to impress visitors the boss led the way again out into the timber yard to a landing stage in the channel there he showed the tramway the booms the position of the bush and rapidly sketched the main details of the work the australians enjoyed his enthusiasm they realized a good deal of the difficulties he had overcome and were amused at but not bored by his vanity they noticed that asia who must have heard the tale many times before heard it sympathetically and inserted flattering details of her own occasionally the bay was now a township it had its own post office its little public school its town hall its football field the store had grown till it was now a warehouse ready to supply everything needed by the countryside for miles around bob hargraves risen to its manager was as proud of it as the engineer was of his engines roland had reason to be proud of his success the bay was now the biggest thing of its kind in the whole colliery milling industry it had become a show-place the governors went up that way shooting always came along to see the big trees and the splendid dams back in the bush tourists from everywhere had visited it the government photographer had been sent to take numerous views of it views that went into all the tourist publications and hung enlarged in government offices all over the dominion the boss could not help showing his pride in it and he had a pleasant feeling that the world was a better place because he had made one corner of it when he had finished all he had to say he asked the australians what they were doing there when they told him he invited them to make themselves at home everywhere he offered them a boat for nothing he asked them to come to dinner any time they felt inclined and made a date to take them into the bush the following week it seems to be the sort of place we were looking for smiled alan ross as the two men walked back to point curtis for lunch yes replied lynn grumpily she liked you 
oh don't be a damned fool lynn lord don't take me so seriously what about the cottage i'll ride up this afternoon if i can get a horse at the pub and if the rain keeps off i shall enjoy a ride again end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Shivering with emotional excitement, Asia lifted her hands from the piano after the final bar of the Kreutzer Sonata and looked up into Bruce's face. Jove, you played that wonderfully. He smiled down at her. You always do play well in a storm, you queer mortal. What's the matter? For she had turned her head suddenly to the window, which rattled viciously as blasts from the river drove against it oh i don't know but i feel as if there was somebody about getting up she went to the window and pressed her face against the panes peering into the blackness uncle david she swung around did you hear someone call why no he moved towards her did you i thought i did but i always do hear voices on nights like these i hear the people who are being wrecked and the people who are being lost and there are always some when a storm comes up as quickly as this one i guess the pater stayed in the bush they moved back into the room asia closed the piano and put away the music then abstractedly she dropped into a chair by the fire bruce noticed how unusually restless she was as he sat down opposite her and began to smoke oh dear she began after a few minutes silence uncle david i hate to disturb you but would you go out and tie up that gate I don't know what is the matter with me, but I can't stand that squeaking tonight. Do you mind? Even if I did, I should go out and fix it. It's damned irritating. She flashed a brilliant smile at him as he got up. He went to the kitchen, took down his oilskin, found a piece of rope, and walked out by way of the back door to the front. Asia held the lamp for him at the sitting-room window. As he wound the rope around the post, Ruth saw something dark on the ground, a few yards away from the paling fence what the devil he muttered but he pretended to finish the job before returning to the kitchen asia come here he called asia closed as she passed it the door of the dining room where betty and mabel sat over their books what is it she whispered is there somebody out there you are uncanny tonight he answered looking at her curiously there is i can't see who it is but he lay in a helpless sort of heap bring him in she said promptly as she held the lamp at the window again she tried vainly to catch a glimpse of the unknown man's face as bruce carried him through the gate and round the veranda as she hurried to the back door she travelled on the wings of a strange excitement but the minute she saw the thin face and the wet black hair she became curiously calm bruce did not see who it was till he laid him on the floor then he raised his eyes to asia well i'll be damned he exclaimed she had told him before who ross was and of her interest in him in sydney and of her meeting with the two men that morning and there will be those who say that life is dull he mused as he undid the sick man's collar asia anxiously pointed out clots of blood in the thick hair what has happened to him get him into my bed at once she cried it was not until bruce had got him undressed washed and bandaged that he could form any accurate opinion as to what had happened to him alan ross was badly stunned and bruised and for some time he resisted all their efforts to restore him to consciousness looks like a fall from a horse said bruce as they sat over him and the bruises are an hour or two old he's been struggling in the storm for some time and i'm afraid he's got a beastly chill he's getting darned feverish i see where your room becomes a hospital blow the horn for bob hargraves we'll have to let the other chap know end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of The Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three. Alan Ross stared spasmodically at the small pale blue object, wondering what it was. It had not hung on the door the night before. He would swear to that. He closed his hot, tired eyes, but each time that he opened them, it was still there. Presently, he made out that it was round and woolly but further effort to account for it became too wearying soon afterwards he made another discovery somebody had taken the varnish off the door he was glad for he hated varnish 
after a short doze he once more studied the blue woolly object he felt sure that somewhere probably in some former reincarnation he had been on familiar terms with it it fascinated and perplexed him he forced his eyes away from it then he knew he was going mad yesterday the paper had been covered with enormous blue daisies attached to green-brown rose leaves on a yellow ground today it was grey with a frieze in pastel shades of blue and rose also daphne never fled from apollo on the pub wall of that he was certain once more he closed his eyes trying to realize that he knew the facts of his personality and environment he determined that come what might he would keep sane he tried to go over what had happened the day before he supposed it was the day before they had walked up from the pub they had seen the cottage they had met his eyes opened and met again the woolly cap now he knew where he had seen it before now he knew where he had got to but what had happened it came back to him slowly the ride to kaiwaka on a cranky horse the long wait for mr king whom he had been determined to see the setting out again in the dusk the onslaught of the storm the accident the oblivion the slow return to consciousness the discovery that he was off the road the sickening fight against stupor the long desperate struggle to reach the river the stimulus of the red mill lamps the last drag along the beach below the cliffs and up the slope towards a light and finally wonderful music he was very tired by the time he had pieced it all together and he realized that he was very ill he found that he could not move without pain and faintness so he lay still trying not to think but indistinct impressions of people of faces eyes and low voices came and went in his subconsciousness when he was able to open his eyes again they rested on rows and rows of books on plain shelves opposite the foot of his bed by degrees he realized different things in the room a verischagen print the very incarnation of loneliness one big palm tree one vulture one tiger and one heap of a man in a jungle clearing he saw Birkeland's isle of death he saw tivoli and venice and the fighting temeraire as turner saw them and he saw prints and etchings of old masters and cathedrals from a corner by the window the winged victory of samothrace seemed to be leaping at him and over the top of an old silver bowl of glorious roses that stood behind his bed he could see the head and shoulders of a small venus de milo and parts of brass candlesticks and bronze ornaments on a high mahogany bureau it all seemed so unreal that he had to open his eyes again upon it several times to be sure that it was really there beside that lonely river feeling the strain of consciousness and enjoyment he dropped off into an uneasy sleep just before lynn stole in again to watch beside him ross had been ill for four days for the first two either bruce or asia had been beside his bed every moment for his chill had turned to pneumonia lynn had been with him all the time dozing fitfully on an improvised bed on the floor he had faithfully obeyed all orders without fuss and wisely saw that it was not the time to look significantly at asia or to take her kindness and hospitality for more than it was worth for the first two nights ross had been delirious and in his fever as he tossed and turned he had begged and implored somebody or something to leave him alone over and over again he had appealed with pitiful intensity to that invisible implacable foe his misery brought tears to asia's eyes and affected even bruce poor devil he's been terribly worried he said to her as they watched on the sixth night after lynn and asia had watched him fall asleep the crisis well passed he thought the situation was advanced sufficiently for him to tell her the story i suppose you know he's married he began oh yes i knew that in sydney she answered lightly then as she appeared interested he went on to tell her of the wretched marriage to a pretty heartless girl who thought she had brains and temperament but who instead had the kind of hysteria that is the hardest in the world to deal with she could be so charming to the people she hoped to get something out of that there were not many who knew what a hell she made of life for her husband finally he had had to leave her providing generously for her out of a small private income but she had pursued him wherever she could even into his law classes and to his public meetings where she had on several occasions made disgraceful scenes worn out temporarily with work for his political party wishing to study law in peace and sick to death of her 
ross had stolen off to new zealand his departure known only to a few friends who were to try to see in his absence if something could not be done with her most of what lynn told her asia knew already as she had had sidelights on ross from various angles she hid her amusement when lynn tried to make it plain that when ross was rested he would return to his law exams his politics and his career and that in future women would be mere incidents by the way she was much too discerning a person not to see why he thus casually disposed of his friend's plans but she let him talk on at the end of another week ross was well enough to take liberties with the situation but he did not take them he ignored whether deliberately or not asia could not say the privileges allowed to the sick he was an admirable patient pitifully grateful for all the attention paid him and patient to a degree that surprised his nurses he gave numerous signs of which he was unconscious of the trying experience through which he had passed while he was very ill he had been indifferent as to who sat with him but as he grew better his eyes began to follow asia wistfully about the room and he kept looking at the door when she was out but it was not until two nights before alice returned that he attempted to take asia's hand as she sat alone beside him End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four asia met her mother at point curtis with the launch one of the new things that alice had welcomed for she had always been nervous in the sailing boat the usual steamer day crowd was waiting on the wharf as the ethel was guided alongside with more fuss than if she had been an ocean liner dear me your ma gets younger every year said a farmer's wife smiling as she spoke at mrs roland who had just recognized her as she stood near asia yes asia looked curiously at her mother seeing her afresh and admiring her new tailored suit alice had been in auckland a month she had gone mainly because the broff company was playing a series of modern plays which asia said she must positively see and because asia had successfully educated roland to face the fact that seeing plays was part of ordinary modern life for women whose husbands were in the position he was roland had become as he had succeeded more susceptible to the mandates of public opinion he had been in the habit of taking women to the theatre if there was anything they wanted to see when he was in auckland but formerly the mere suggestion that his wife should take a trip to the city for the purpose of seeing plays would have met with a snort of scorn however asia had taken full advantage of the fact that at various times passing travellers in for a meal had assumed that the wife of so prosperous a person as the boss naturally visited auckland at intervals to keep up to date though not a highly suggestible person where spending money on his wife was concerned the boss had in the last year or two become more generous to her and he was quick to see where anything in his treatment of her was likely to reflect upon himself so that if she wished to go to auckland she was now free to go and she had on occasions accompanied her husband at his own request to attend some big function where the addition of a beautiful wife helped his social status this last time alice had gone with bruce as escort a business trip for roland happening to coincide with the arrival of the broff company it had been the first they had ever taken together and it had been the boss's suggestion alice had stayed with the hardings and bruce had lived at an hotel the morals of auckland would have survived their staying under the same roof and mrs harding laughed at alice's scruples but could not cure them frequent visits to the city were only a part of recent changes in alice's life ever since the birth of her last dead baby she had lived alone in her room she did not know that bruce in his capacity as doctor had after much deliberation decided to talk seriously to her husband about her health which had declined steadily after elsie's birth she had merely thought that at last he had come to feel that she was unattractive as a wife and that he preferred to drop the pretense of caring for her in the only way she had supposed he cared but she was puzzled over the fact that he had become not less kind and friendly as she would have expected but more generous and more considerate personally she had no regrets for the change in their relations but only an intense gratitude mingled sometimes with the fear that as her health improved he might claim her as his wife again 
he had never spoken to her on the subject of the change which had come about naturally nobody had remarked on the fact that after her long illness he had continued to sleep in bunty's room her children had not appeared to notice it asia had never hinted at any knowledge of it and so the thing she had longed for but could never have managed for herself had happened without her knowing how eight months before the arrival of the australians alice had had an operation which had been urged by david bruce to save attacks of pain and debility from which she had long suffered asia returned from sydney the day her mother went into hospital and helped to nurse her back to what proved to be a second youth it was while they were both in a rotorua sanatorium where alice was being massaged by the best masseur in the colony that they had got the news of mrs brayton's sudden death as alice had received a spirited letter from her only three days before the news was a shock to both her and asia and the manner of the gallant old lady's passing as it was told in the papers upset them still more mrs brayton had always declared that she would die standing and she almost did she had caught influenza a disease she despised and in spite of david bruce's protests as to its seriousness she refused to go to bed in the middle of one morning after he had been up with her all night and had told her she was not to get up her heartbroken old maids found her gasping on the floor partly dressed before they could even get her on to her lounge she was dead asia kept the reports of the funeral from her mother as long as she could but alice evaded her and bought old papers giving accounts of it it had taken on the size and importance in the public mind of a great event tom roland had closed all his works and the kaiwaka and bay schools had a holiday people from a radius of twenty miles had crowded round the grave in a corner of her garden sobbing for something they had lost even if it was only the oft-told tale of her open gate and her home-brewed ale and her pleasant chatter to all who had seen her in her own domain she was to remain a vision an ideal appropriately haloed by the grandeur of her material possessions the fact that she had left a good sum of money to local charities and to the school funds probably intensified somewhat the enthusiastic expressions of grief in some directions more or less public but she was privately enshrined for ever in the hearts of many to whom she had been a fairy godmother as time went on she was more quoted than the bible and she became a sort of legend with the children growing up a beautiful spirit of the river and the hills her death changed the character of the bay for the three people who had been her real intimates to alice bruce and to asia some virtue had gone out of the place never to return they all realized within a short time that its hold on them had loosened that there was a vacancy about that garden in the pines that they were continuously conscious of that it was like a dull ache ever present the death of the old lady combined with her mother's illness had influenced asia to subdue most of the effects of the city of sydney upon herself it was not until they had been back at the bay two months that alice discovered that she had learned to smoke and that she gave other signs of complete emancipation from the old-fashioned ways of her mother's generation but alice was not as shocked about it as asia thought she was she knew that mrs brayton had smoked occasionally with bruce then alice had seen not without a secret amusement in the last six months that she was being educated by asia in the direction of modernism the process had really begun soon after asia went to sydney with a positive avalanche of books that everybody is reading shaw wells and company alice suspected that both bruce who took with enthusiasm to the intellectuals and dory harding who wrote continually of them were in the plot to clear puritanism finally out of her constitution at first shaw had shocked her she took more kindly to wells's sociological books but by degrees bruce got her to make the distinction between the intellectual assent and the personal deed with regard to actions she would not even have spoken about a few years before one result of her determination to interest herself in modern plays and books had been less introspection and she had been surprised to see that her health had improved with her new interests it had improved so much after she had got over mrs brayton's death that she began to wonder what had happened to her and more than once asia had made scandalous remarks about her reaching the dangerous age remarks that at first amused and then vaguely disturbed her but the greatest joy of the past six months had been alice's realization of her improved relations with asia 
although the friendship between them had not included exactly the sort of confidences she felt she should have had it had been something so much more than they had had for years that it was a source of emotional satisfaction that partly made up for the loss of mrs brayton's sympathy the only cloud upon it had been the knowledge that some day she would go away again there was one direction in which alice's ignorance of asia deceived her into thinking that there was yet nothing to know asia's adventures with men were entirely unknown to her mother what personal experiences she had had in her concert tour in new zealand and later in sydney nothing very disturbing to the stability of public morals and no more illuminating to herself than those she had had before she had kept entirely to herself and as far as her mother could see she was much the same as she had been before she went away alice firmly believed that however extravagantly she might talk and however unconventional she might be in certain directions she would be moral when it came to action asia waited for the steamer with mingled feelings knowing herself and thinking she knew her mother she had a presentiment that their relationship was to be tested as it never had been but all thought of trouble was cleared from her mind by the sight of her mother in her new suit at forty-two alice was now a more beautiful woman than she had ever been and this time she came home flushed with what had been to her some social triumph dory harding who was more devoted to her than ever had arranged a series of entertainments in her honour and alice had tasted something of a social homage that was more pleasant than she had ever imagined it could be she had been a centre of attention had felt that people listened when she spoke and had known the delight of being well and suitably dressed among people who would approve her taste with critical intelligence she saw at once with childish pleasure that asia was delighted with her new clothes why mother what have you been doing to yourself she whispered as she kissed her i feel better than i have for years alice smiled back indeed i don't know when i felt so well it was not until they were halfway home after alice had told with pride some details of the fine time she had had that asia attempted to give any local news we've had a diversion too she began carelessly stooping to look at the engine yes two men australians on a holiday and one of them met with an accident and has been very ill we've had him home he's getting better they're both very nice why you did not tell me in your letters said alice looking at her and immediately sensing something significant in the omission well i did not have much time mr ross had pneumonia and nearly died asia again turned her attention to the machinery but her mother was not deceived by her casualness instead she felt one of her uncanny presentiments that there was more in this than met the eye her presentiment crystallized into a conviction when she had been home half an hour she had found ross lying convalescent on the front room sofa and lynn with his arms full of kites which he had made for bunty and elsie waiting with them on the spit to meet her both men took her breath away by hailing her with boyish friendliness she did not realize that her children had spoken of her in such a way that both men felt they knew her before they saw her nobody had hinted that she might not receive them in the same spirit that the boss and bruce and asia had shown Alan Ross perceived the mistake immediately. Usually, when Alice returned from Auckland, she was the centre of a pleasant fuss for a few hours at least. For, apart from the excitement of receiving the presents she now always brought for them, her children liked to know what she had seen and done, and they liked to rival each other in claims for her first attentions. But this time her homecoming was robbed of almost all its importance by the fact that Asia was that night to give a dinner party in the front room partly to celebrate her return but more as she guessed later to celebrate ross's recovery alice felt the more hurt because she had looked forward to telling them more than ever what she had enjoyed while away asia had no time to do more than unlock her mother's trunk before she said she must see about the dinner bunty seized upon the mechanical toy she had brought him and rushed off to show it to ross and lynn betty who now taught in the kaiwaka school and mabel who was a probationer in the school at the head of the bay were not yet home so only elsie was there to be impressed and even she was obsessed by the coming festivity it's going to be a real dinner party mother she said her eyes popping out of her head with all our silver and candles 
and just roses asia says and i can sit up if i'm good there she's calling me and the child ran gaily off leaving alice alone with her open trunk and her things scattered over the bed for a while she tried to go on with her unpacking and to ignore the fact that she was feeling hurt then the air of fuss and importance about the house was too much for her she went out to the kitchen after changing her suit for a house dress asia was putting the last touches to a panful of fat spring chickens with barry lynn hovering about ready to hand her things what can i do alice asked oh nothing thank you mother answered asia briskly everything's done now we did most of it this morning i've only got the flowers and the table there's nothing else till dinner time you finish your unpacking and then rest don't get overtired i'm not tired replied alice with a sense of injury as she turned away there was no part for her to play she saw and for some reason she wanted to join in she went back to her room annoyed with herself for feeling badly she took up a new brown silk dress a lovely soft thing shot with gold that she had paid for with money given to her by david bruce she was half fearful that her husband thinking his money had paid for it would think it ridiculous extravagance for there was nothing at the bay for her to wear it to and she would have been still more afraid to have him know that he had not paid for it she had always felt rather guilty about the presents of money bruce had given her when she went to auckland and she had been careful to spend them in ways that were not conspicuous enough to attract roland's attention but the brown dress had been too much for her she had bought it in company with dory harding and david bruce who both conspired to soothe her conscience as to her right to spend so much upon one garment they had persuaded her to try it on and once on it was fatal alice felt afterwards that much of her success was due to it but as she looked at it now she thought she had been foolish to buy it and that apart from bruce no one would care whether she wore it or not as she stood holding it up betty and mabel walked in they were now pretty fresh girls of no violently radical tendencies and with no promise yet of the outstanding individuality of their father or of the distinction of their mother when roland said they would have to earn their own living and be useful whether he could afford to keep them or not they decided to become teachers and both had made satisfactory beginnings in the profession to them asia had always been something of an outsider and they had grown up happy in their friendship for each other they were just the attractive normal sentimental and conventional girls that organized society expects its young women to be oh mother they cried together kissing her what a lovely dress alice was pleased that they liked it you are going to wear it for our party said mabel i don't know oh yes mother do look nice it's to be a swagger party you must wear it well i'll see then alice found the blouse lengths of silk that she had brought for them they had barely thanked her when they heard asia calling for them she wants us said betty we must go oh mother aren't mr ross and mr lynn just lovely they ran out excitedly leaving alice once more robbed of her audience and shut out of the preparations for the dinner as she went on with her unpacking she heard the constant tramping up and down the hall asia's voice calling for this and that sounds of furniture being moved gay voices and laughter she felt as if she had been away a long time as if she did not belong there any more as if she were the interloper in the house again she was angry with herself for being so stupid why should they not have a party even if it were for the two men why should she not get into a party mood and not act as if they had set her aside when she had put away all her clothes she went out into the garden the children had finished gathering the roses and were now busy inside alice strolled round the beds rejoicing in new flowers and planning where she would put the plants she had brought home with her then she sat down on a garden seat to watch a fine sunset that finally helped her to eliminate herself from her consciousness and send her inside disposed to cast a more friendly eye upon the inevitable readjustments soon afterwards asia poked her head in through the doorway mother do look nice to-night you are the guest of honour you know have you anything new to wear i have a brown dress began alice brown asia sounded sceptical well if it suits you do put it on then she vanished in the direction of the kitchen 
then alice decided that she would wear the brown dress and that she would do her hair very carefully after all david bruce would notice it if no one else did so she began one of the most painstaking toilets she had ever made at the end when she viewed herself in the glass she felt she had not done badly her beautiful hair was only just beginning to show the grey her colour was better than it had been for years and her eyes showed a vitality that she had thought would never return to them but her chief charm lay in something not to be pointed out in this feature or in that not even in her graceful figure it lay in something life had made of her a capacity for being better than she knew she had no intention of making a dramatic entrance but it so happened that when she walked into the front room bruce who had just entered and lynne and asia and the girls were all standing round the sofa where ross sat propped up by cushions the table was laid the candles lit the whole room bowered in roses everybody turned as she moved forward why mother if you don't look stunning burst out asia in the manner of her early childhood and the eyes of everyone else reflected her opinion alice paused flushing and obviously presenting this frank praise before men she did not know then catching bruce's eye she was warned in time and smiled but she saw that even that brief resentment had done something to the general enthusiasm and that she must try to resolve it so with the air of being very nice she looked at ross she was not sure yet which of the two men asia preferred i hope this fuss is not tiring you she began solicitously not at all thank you he replied warmly his dark eyes going up to her for he knew he wanted her to like him bruce placed a chair for her and sat down himself on the edge of the sofa we still have to take care of him though he said looking from ross to alice he has been a very sick man mrs roland this beginning restored the flow of talk that had been interrupted by alice's entrance lynne and the girls chattered on among themselves while ross began in answer to a question of hers to tell alice how he came to get ill before he was well begun the boss came in humming as he did when there was anything unusual on to which he wished to appear quite accustomed he had changed his suit and put on a clean collar at asia's request well how are things now he asked cheerfully whisking up to the sofa party with the air of inquiring after a business or a public movement and not stopping for ross to finish the sentence he had begun they all saw he was addressing the invalid i'm improving fast thanks ross smiled up at him as if there was a secret understanding between them he thoroughly enjoyed tom roland's idiosyncrasies as he turned to look for a chair the boss got the full effect of his wife as she sat back in her rocker he had barely seen her on the spit that day as she landed well he grunted oblivious of the fact that to her the australians were still strangers you look as if you'd taken a new lease of life seeing plays must be healthy alice was not yet equal to taking him lightly in such situations both bruce and asia saw the necessity for diplomacy get up and bow mother and in future always wear brown dresses laughed asia and keep on going to see plays smiled bruce you see asia explained gaily to ross we have at last got mother to see that some contact with this wicked world need not interfere with the pursuit of higher things so she has been seeing the liars and the gay lord quex and niobe and lady windermere's fan with the result that she has bought without my assistance that adorable dress and looks younger than ever i have always told her that too much pursuit of higher things was incompatible with a good complexion everybody laughed for asia said it with delightful impertinence mingled with her obvious affection for her mother even alice laughed but ross who was a sensitive person knew that she thought the whole conversation in very bad taste however as asia's remarks had been addressed to him he felt he had to say something well mrs roland if complexions are the test you have preserved a very nice balance between god and maman alice could not help responding to the mischief in his eyes or to the old-fashioned look of homage that followed it then the conversation became normal again and asia and the girls went off to put the finishing touches to the sauces and the gravy the australians knew that asia had never imagined for a moment that she would impress them by her little dinner she had joked about using all the family silver and so on but there was no pretension about the function or the spirit in which it was given but all the same 
there were things about it that were distinctive ross and lynn had never seen so many roses in one room before they had never eaten better chicken they had never sat down with a man who interested them more than david bruce or with women who charmed them more than asia and her mother and to do him credit the boss was at his best it was his home and he had paid for everything so to him the glory of the party was a reflection from his own generosity and he was sure the two men understood this it put him in most excellent spirits and called forth whenever he got the chance his choicest collection of stories from his dramatic life alice realized before the meal had gone very far that she was after all really enjoying it for everybody treated her as if she were indeed the guest of honour bruce's attitude she took of course for granted it was too familiar a thing to be remarked but she had not expected quite the amount or kind of attention that she received from ross and lynn and it pleased her to feel that their homage was due to something more than her position as hostess there was something especially flattering about the way ross regarded her opinions of the place she had seen he did not have the superior air of kindly tolerance that asia had been unable to hide he looked and spoke as if he valued her judgment alice had started the meal with reserves she had meant to give the whole of her attention to bruce in a manner that would convey to these young men the fact that whatever asia might think of them her good opinion was something not to be easily won but long before the meal was over she had succumbed to ross's charm and she did not remember till afterwards that bruce had talked very little and that he had given leads for the younger men to follow several whispered conversations followed the dinner lynn chose an unlucky moment when helping asia to put the food away in a dark corner of the scullery to put his arms impulsively round her and kiss her no don't be a fool boy she said with a touch of contempt and though she talked on as if it had been the most negligible of incidents the rest of the evening was saddened for him soon after the table was finally cleared bruce said ross had to go to bed asia preceded him to her room lit his candle turned down the bedclothes and altered the windows she lingered so that she would be there when he came in when he did he partly closed the door behind him you are tired she said softly her eyes reaching out to him a little but no matter it was a charming dinner little girl he stood easily before her sure of his right to make a move if he wanted to and therefore in no hurry to make it why didn't you tell me your mother was such an interesting person mother why of course she's wonderful i suppose i'm used to her but she's really old-fashioned is she it wasn't so obvious to me she reminded me of an ivy-covered tower i saw somewhere in england that had weathered many storms it had a beauty i shall never forget asia looked at him she knew he was not saying this to impress her that in fact he had forgotten her for the moment i'm glad you liked her i hope she likes you she went on but she is a very peculiar person to please i prefer people who make careful selections it is so much more flattering when they choose oneself he smiled gleefully at her as he held out his hand then moved by one of the few impulses he had let run away with him he raised her hand to his face held it a moment rubbed it against his cheek and kissed it lingeringly raising his face he challenged hers with a look that asked many questions then he smiled as if the answers were satisfactory and putting his hands on her shoulders he turned her to the door without another word while roland and lynn smoked in the front room bruce and alice maneuvered themselves out into the dining-room which was empty for betty and mabel were washing up bruce had talked with his eyes many times that evening but he had to put it into words my dear you really are a miracle i have never oh david don't be foolish she interrupted half laughing it must be the dress partly but mostly health yes i do feel well david who are these men he knew that was chiefly what she wanted to talk to him about i don't know any more than you do he answered carelessly do you like them why yes don't you he looked quizzically at her i don't know she began cautiously he chuckled are they going to be here long they've taken king's cottage below the mill for some months i believe they have why do you say it like that he saw that she had already begun to anticipate what are they doing here she evaded lynn writes and is after copy ross is studying for the law this is a funny place to study for law not at all it's a first-rate place 
he brought a case full of books then they heard the boss saying good night to lynn who was returning to the cottage and they rose to go back to the sitting-room later asia followed bruce out of the back door to the side gate i congratulate you he began softly your mother likes ross that was the object of the dinner wasn't it oh uncle david you always deprive people of the pleasure of explaining their actions it is unkind but you were lovely at dinner and didn't he talk well he did he smiled at her over the gate you certainly got something ahead of you to manage haven't you he drawled i predict that your talents will not get rusty for a while she looked back at him saying nothing didn't mother look stunning she veered abruptly bruce laughed outright don't you think you can snub me he said taking her by the shoulders i didn't mean to uncle david she answered seriously she looked as if she wanted to say something more but after a brief uncertainty she bobbed up on her toes and kissed him and ran from him to the other side of the house bruce pursued his way to his shanty speculating as to what the morrows would bring forth end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five the next day alice saw that ross was the preferred man and she heard also through one of the girls whom lynn had told because they asked him that he was married she knew that he possessed the same characteristics after she had received this information as he had before but her opinion of them mysteriously changed she did not mean to allow any sign of the change to appear in her manner until she had had more time to consider the possibilities that lay ahead for two days she avoided danger by staying away from asia and ross finding her excuse in the amount of work which she said had to be done in the garden on the third morning ross told asia that he felt well enough to move to his cottage she knew that he was not strong enough to go or to eat as he and lynn would be likely to eat and that he would not be ready for it for another week at least and she guessed also why he spoke that afternoon as alice sat sewing and resting beside her western window asia opened the door after a short knock and walked halfway across the room where she stood with a rigidity unlike her usual ease and mobility alice sensed trouble in her cool level tones mother mr ross talks of moving to-morrow he isn't well enough to go and he has to stay here another week you must have made him feel he isn't wanted i'm sure i've done nothing of the kind said alice warmly as she looked up i've been perfectly courteous i didn't say you hadn't mother you might be that and yet not want him to stay but he won't be any trouble to you and you must let him think you do want him to stay their eyes met for a moment and alice saw something new and defiant and fiercely hostile at the back of asia's something she had never seen before it startled her my dear of course i've nothing against his staying i had supposed he would what do you want me to do well you will have to make it plain mother sick people are very sensitive i don't know what i've done went on alice it isn't what you've done mother so much as something you're thinking and you have a manner that would freeze hell she saw her mother was hurt by this expression but at the moment she did not care what do you want me to do asked alice with an air of resignation that taxed asia's patience mother you know very well don't pretend you don't i know what you are thinking but you might as well stop it because that sort of thinking never does any good now i'm going to make tea will you have it with us and will you act as if you were enjoying it though to alice this resembled an invitation to put her head in the lion's mouth she fought her feeling of hurt and resentment very well she said quietly turning asia swung out with an air suggestive of a final ultimatum uncompromising candor was a thing alice could never cope with in any one but bruce who knew how to temper it with humor and graciousness asia's cold words sensible and straight though they were left her sore and helpless she wondered how after this interval she could possibly go out and be pleasant and natural to alan ross she wondered how she was to rid herself of the sense of fate that had hung over her for three days she wondered how she could keep out of her manner the evidence of the thoughts that would crowd her mind but she felt she must try that something she had seen in asia's eyes frightened her she wanted passionately to keep something she did not know how to keep she stood up and looked out upon the sun-swept river and the drowsy western hills 
all life seemed drugged in the enervating stillness of that soft spring day all except that around the mills which remained as ever oblivious of heat and cold and sun and rain she saw a clutch of flitches rise into the air between the masts of a vessel at one of the wharves she watched it swing and drop and disappear into the hold the hum and grind and scream of the machinery were deadened a little by the humidity in the air but there was something in the vitality of that agglomeration of sounds that helped her she smoothed her hair put in a new comb inspected her hands and taking up the garment she had been sewing she walked into the front room she did not know whether ross knew that asia had spoken to her it must be tea-time she began with a forced serenity ross knew nothing of the recent interview but he felt her restraint because she attracted him he was determined to overcome it he raised himself off his cushions i think miss roland is making it let me get you a chair oh no thank you commended alice quickly don't attempt to get up please she walked to a rocker near the fireplace as she sat down she saw that he would have to turn round in order to face her and sit comfortably he made a move to readjust himself don't move she said getting up again won't you come nearer so that i can talk to you he asked she thought his voice sounded appealing as he looked at her across the top of the table and unable to resist that friendliness she dragged her chair to the foot of the sofa and sat down facing him as he settled himself again one of the cushions slipped to the floor i will get it said alice as she saw him stoop the something curiously intimate about arranging cushions for a person sick or well affected her as she fixed them for him and some of the hostility that had crept into her thoughts of him disappeared he looked up gratefully at her with a look of homage and genuine interest that had attracted her at the dinner she felt that perhaps she had been misjudging him she took up her sewing have you been ill before she asked i have never had to go to bed before he replied then it's a new experience quite it is not a pleasant one no but i've found that it has its compensations he smiled again at her she did not know whether he meant to include her company among these compensations she would have been suspicious of any compliment and she made no attempt to acknowledge it as such she went on with her sewing determined that he should do his share of making conversation ross lay easily still for a minute or two watching her he liked the simplicity of her gingham dress and lace fichu the grace of her bowed head the delicate movements of her white nervous hands about the muslin and lace then the smallness and fineness of the garment interested him he wondered if he dared ask what it was presently when he decided that it was not anything with an embarrassing name he put out his hand what is that he asked touching it it is a christening dress for a baby the hargraves her tone implied that it could not possibly mean anything to him but she held it up ross looked at it saying nothing it was the first time he had noticed anything belonging to a very little child and he was amazed himself at the sudden effect it had upon him at the things it suggested he forgot all about alice as he looked at it feeling that his silence was significant she stole a glance at him she saw reverence delicacy and sentiment in his eyes and she felt that a man who could look like that could not be a villain can a child get into that he asked taking hold of it oh yes they're very small at first you know she found herself actually smiling at him his real interest in the little garment touched her at that moment asia appeared in the doorway with the tea she gave one look at ross with the christening dress in his hands and one at her mother leaning towards him and then her eyes lit up with a wild amusement but ross barely looked at her as she walked in and put her tray on a small table there's something very appealing about it isn't there he said to alice as he handed her back the lace and muslin yes i feel so she answered amazed that he should this little incident affected her opinion of him more than she was then aware asia came forward with cups of tea her manner entirely innocent of any significance after she had served cake she sat down at the end of the sofa and led ross to talk of his work and sydney he noticed while he talked addressing himself almost entirely to alice that they both avoided looking at each other and that alice had lost the ease she was coming to when the tea was brought in he chose an appropriate place to say that it was time he stopped loafing and got to work i have told miss roland i will get down to the cottage to-morrow i have imposed on your kindness long enough he said i don't think you have imposed on my kindness at all said alice quickly with a change of manner asia rose to get more tea well i must be an infernal bother he went on 
feeling something he could not define if you were considering me alice achieved a pleasantness that surprised herself you must know that you are no bother to me if asia likes to make a trouble of you that is her affair at this asia wondered what had happened to her mother we are used to taking in strangers went on alice it is a habit we have acquired in this place and we never make a trouble of it you will please stay here till you are quite well though still uncertain about it he felt there was nothing for him to do but to thank her and stay that night alice went out to walk up and down the beach to try to face what she was now sure was coming she craved for a bruce but he and roland had gone that day to the bush to be away for days leaving her more alone than she had ever felt before though she was by no means sure that he would see eye to eye with her in this situation she felt he was now the only thing she really had she had tried to take comfort from the words spoken hurriedly by him the evening before when she asked him if he knew that ross was married he had treated the matter lightly and had again begged her not to anticipate and had assured her that ross and asia were as familiar with the conventions as she was and that they could take care of themselves but now the look that had flashed across asia's eyes that afternoon troubled her it lit up the future for her it opened out a panorama of disaster that now seemed to her to be inevitable alice had faced more or less calmly for some time now the fact that asia would probably marry someone she did not like with the memory of mrs brayton's story in her mind she had determined that whoever it was she would make the best of it it was the one thing in her life she would have been ready for she had prayed with but faint hopes that it would not be an actor or a reformer of too pronounced a type or a weakling of the kind that often attracted strong women but she had prepared herself for the worst even in this direction her visions of a professional man and a gentleman were she always knew too good to be true but as usual the thing she had not prepared herself for was the thing that was going to happen it had never occurred to her that asia might fall in love with a married man she had the familiar delusion that though other people's children did such things her own could not and the bitter irony in the situation was that alan ross single would have been just the sort of husband she would have welcomed while alan ross married was the least desirable thing in the world she did not know yet whether there were any chances of a divorce but even if she had known there were it would have made no difference to her just then the unkindest cut of all was that this situation came at a time when she had been about to rest upon her oars when she had hoped that at last her life was to flow in the pleasant places when at last her old haunting sense of failure had become less insistent and the tragedies of her past had settled back into an undisturbed region of her subconsciousness it was this crowning cruelty that brought slow tears of self-pity to her eyes as she walked back and forth on the sand she had so wanted peace she had so wanted forgetfulness and some measure of happiness it stunned her to think that there was design in this the working out of some immutable law that would never leave her alone then the old delusion that it must be stopped that it could be stopped and that she could stop it took possession of her it was unthinkable that it should go on she was sure they did not realize where they were drifting sure they had not faced the facts sure that even when they did begin to face them they would be overlooking something vital but she told herself they were both fine and honorable they did not mean to bring misery to each other and they would listen to her and she believed that what she had to say would open their eyes to the danger they were in she was anticipating the end before the beginning had well begun she felt calmer after she had made the decision to speak until she began to ask herself which of them she would talk to the difficulty of it made her sick she tortured herself with imaginary conversations beginning now with asia and now with ross but she knew facing them in theory on the beach was a very different thing from looking them in the face and the suspicion that she might fail and that they might go their own way in spite of her grew upon her she began to cry helplessly then she raged against the man who had brought this upon her then she cried again until she was too worn out to think about it any more as she went to bed she decided that it might be wiser to wait and see how they went on when she met them at lunch the next day she wondered what she had been worrying about nothing could have been saner or calmer or more normal emotionally than the two people she had seen the evening before on the edge of the abyss of unbridled passions there were no traces of nervousness about asia 
and as she watched ross cut bread for the children she felt as she had felt the day before that he could not be a scoundrel but it was only in their presence that she felt thus disarmed away from them her fatal intuition regained possession of her she tried to comfort herself with the knowledge that they belonged to a generation that had collected along with other ethical novelties the right to free and open friendships between the sexes she knew auckland was full of such friendships but she had observed that in spite of the freedom they were commented on and that people always wondered about them with a certain expression in the eye and a certain raising of the shoulders it did not matter to her that the remarks were more often in the nature of amused speculation than judgment the fact that they were remarked on at all proved to her that they were not accepted naturally by society it was not till she had thought back and forth for three days that she remembered that her friendship with bruce might have been questioned by the strictly orthodox but she told herself at once that that was a very different thing from the friendship between ross and asia she was so sure of it that she attempted no analysis of the difference she shut her mind against any comparison she grew lonelier and lonelier each day her children were not rude to her nor did they neglect her but she saw that their attentions were a little forced hypnotized by the company of the two men they would forget her and then remembering come ostentatiously to see if she wanted anything she sat a good deal in her own room the only time she really saw them all was at meals she pretended to be busy gardening and sewing she forced herself to be pleasant one evening when asia asked her if she did not want to join them all for a walk on the beach she went feeling it was a doubtful experiment as it proved to be she could not enter into their gaiety seeing as she did the grim hand of fate above them all she began to see treachery in ross's careful attentions she could not help it she left them early with the conviction that she had spoilt their walk and that they all knew it the next day the day ross was to leave for the cottage alice awoke with a headache she did not mention it because it would look almost as if she had done it on purpose all her children had planned to escort ross to his home and install him with a tea asia spent the morning cooking enough food to last the men for days as it was saturday and they were all home the house resounded with noise and laughter alice felt miserably that she must make an effort to be pleasant at lunch she drank hot water took soda bathed her face with eau de cologne and finally took brandy but she looked so ill when she sat down to table that they all noticed it she was sure she read in asia's eyes a veiled impatience after a few minutes she got up and begging them to take no notice of her but to go on with their fun just as they meant to she left them and went back to her own room as she was getting cold water and a towel to bathe her face asia came in alice turned on her desperately now what are you bothering about me for she demanded i can look after myself it's just the heat why mother it's no bother you look very sick you must stop gardening in the sun though asia guessed that the sun was not the sole cause of the trouble she ignored the other features in the case she had made up her mind to manage her mother without emotional scenes as far as she could and she was determined to be patient and to bear with her suspicions and premature judgments i'm all right persisted alice i only want to lie down and be still very well mother and i don't want any one to stay home with me this afternoon her tone implied that she knew she was a nuisance but that she would not have any sacrifices made for her taking her at her word asia said all right and left her alice began to cry but realizing that that would make her head worse she controlled herself and bathed her face and neck also she meant to get up and see the party leave and she knew she dare not show traces of tears when asia came to the door to tell her that they were going she got up powdered her face a performance she had taken to rather guiltily on her last visit to auckland and sniffed her smelling salts faced with that smiling eager group she felt as if she were on trial she felt she had no business to send them off with anything in their minds that would spoil their afternoon she felt as if they were appealing to her to justify them in the enjoyment of their youth and good spirits i'm better she said in answer to ross's question i stayed out too long in the sun i hope you will all have a lovely afternoon and a very nice tea-party don't you think you are well enough to come he asked alice could detect no lack of sincerity in his tone i won't come to-day thank you she succeeded in saying lightly but may some time soon may i stay till dark mother appealed bunty seeing she was in a gracious mood 
if you have been asked to she smiled and with that smile upon her face they left her they did not forget as they frolicked down the hill to turn and wave to her and something about that little attention which none of the children ever forgot touched and comforted her but before she had been alone long a sense of terrible loneliness overwhelmed her something like the stillness of death seemed to brood over the house she felt she could not stay in it so as her head felt better she went down to talk to mrs hargraves whom she saw sitting with her children on her back porch with them she was forced to fight her own thoughts out of action and the effort did her good she stayed with them till she saw roland and bruce ride up to the stables by the men's kitchen then she hurried home to get a meal ready for them she had no chance to talk to bruce that night or for some time afterwards for he went off on business to the wairoa and when he returned a government party had to be shown round and entertained for several days asia did her full share of the management necessitated by this hospitality she got eliza king down from kaiwaka to help so that her absences would put no extra work on her mother she did not try to get out of playing to the guests in the evening and she went on one excursion to the bush but alice watching saw that ross and lynn were included in all the hospitalities and that somehow or other asia was with them or with ross every day when the visitors finally departed asia told her mother that she was going to coach ross with his french she did not elaborate the statement to say when or where but she began to disappear after dinner at night and her hours for returning soon brought home to alice the conviction that if she was ever to speak it must be soon end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six no french to-night repeated ross he had risen from a stump to meet asia as she crossed the clearing he saw that she carried a kit stuffed with things done up in newspaper and a lantern she had on an old print dress faded to whiteness and wore no hat a bit of the sunset came through the trees to gleam upon her hair where are you going he demanded as she came up to him over on the gum field somebody dying i think he came up the day you did consumption uncle david was there last night but he can't go to-night alan ross looked curiously at her he saw she went to dying men as simply as she did other things belonging to the place it did not occur to him to pay her any compliments about it how far is it he asked between three and four miles why don't you ride the track's too bad at night i want to come he said a light flashing across his eyes she caught her breath but tried to answer lightly you would be bored i may read the bible and pray but he did not smile as she expected him to do you ever he asked gravely yes often wouldn't you do anything a dying man wanted you to do certainly if i could they stood still their eyes challenging back and forth they both suspected that if they went together the night would hold more for them than the shadow of death may i come he appealed she tried to keep her voice casual of course if you want to but it won't be pleasant he may die again he looked at her die he thought could anybody die with her about but he felt he passionately wanted to go that nothing could keep him from going he answered her by reaching for her kit with a few remarks about the beauty of the evening they went out of the clearing and a little way down the great north road before asia turned into a track that led over the range on the northern side it was wide enough for them to see their way in the sunset light as it was a good deal of a climb they scrambled up silently ross a few paces behind her at the top at a place where fire had cleared a space she paused and they both stood to recover their breath and to watch the sunset and the view the river right angled in the hills below them was veiled in places by a gathering haze above the mill it lay leaden in the shadows of the forest slopes but about the gap it was alive under the opaline shades of the sky roofs and windows about the bay in the line of shafts of light flashed back copper suns of their own stalks of smoke shining into filmy heads in the still air rose from the cottage chimneys from the chained powers in the mill mysterious vibrations floated upwards mingling with the night stirring in the forest trees intermittent sounds cut in upon the flow of the undertones scraps of song and music the barking of dogs the deep singing tones of bullock bells mellowed by distance 
lights starting up about the hills below point curtis revealed the presence of farmhouses and maori settlements east of them they could see only the bush wall that rose in tiers toward the gap besides pukikaroro to the north of them lay low land as far as they could see the gum field ross and lynn had heard so much about all ross could see as he now looked at it for the first time was a wide area of what looked like nothingness in comparison with the view elsewhere its pygmy slopes and valleys visible by day now merged into the dead level of monotonous wastes what vagrant trees it had were dwarfed to the level of the tea-tree and the fern themselves the poorest of their kind for the blood of the soil had gone centuries before into the life of a kauri forest of which now the only trace was the gum the hardened sap of the great trees that had once proudly whispered to the sun and the stars but as ross looked at it there grew into it the colours he had heard asia speak about such gullies as it had deepened into the strong barbaric blues that the modern artist has rediscovered for the world its burnt slopes sprang to life in patches of purple and brown that seemed lit from within for five minutes its colours stayed hot and crude like jewels glowing over a furnace and then a film crept out of the night and dulled them like clouds of grey tulle spread over a gay and many-coloured robe as they faded out they left the wastes they had glorified more desolate than ever moved by the same impulse asia and ross turned hungry eyes upon each other neither wanted to speak but each wanted a swift reassurance that the night had got them in the same way seeing that it had they stood for a moment each trying to hide the exultation of it then asia remembered the nature of their errand come on she said resting her hand for a minute on his arm the track down the ridge on this side ran through a section that had been swept by fire a leafless sapless company of trees whitened by exposure raised mutilated trunks and branches above an undergrowth of young fern these forest ghosts growing more wraith-like every minute in the twilight formed a fitting gateway to that desolation whither they were bound when they reached the border of the gum field at the foot of the ridge asia paused to light her lantern ross looked out over the gathering darkness where he could distinguish nothing that could act as a guide already he fancied he could smell the stench of stagnant swamps the dust of dead men's bones do you know the way he asked but he was not afraid he would have followed her anywhere that night for the great and glorious madness had got him as it gets a man only once in life oh yes she looked up at him exultantly knowing that in this her domain he would feel a feeble creature and would the more appreciate her native cunning i know every inch of it our sick man is in the earl's hut that is we called him an earl he had a title of some kind he built it six years ago and he died in it two years later whisky then another englishman had it he was left money and went home then a teacher also an englishman drifted to it he died there six months ago whisky and pneumonia now this poor devil whisky and consumption i have read the bible and prayed for them all in turn you have he mumbled looking at her as if he saw her afresh well they want it funny but they want it but it's so pathetic it makes me sick these gum fields are the saddest places in the world they won't bear thinking about come on and she again took up her lantern some eight years before roland had taken over from the government the right to lease this gum field which lay for miles beside his own bush and since that time he and bruce and later asia had been more or less in touch with a strange company of down and outs who had applied for a license to dig in keeping with the usual custom the diggers brought their gum to the boss's store for sale at current rates and were paid either in money or in kind as they preferred as roland had neither exploited the squeezing possibilities of the arrangement made by the field owners and leasers for their own benefit he was besieged with applications all of which he could not fill because a field had a capacity for so many men and no more ross had learned enough of the facts of the gum digging life from asia to be tremendously interested in its peculiar atmosphere in the early days of the colony's history fortunes had been quickly made by the men who had the chance to pick it up in quantities on the surface of the ground and in the bed of streams the nuggets of amber that only the kauri tree produces as the tree itself grows only in the northern half of the auckland province the fortune-giving area was limited and the day of speedy riches soon came to an end then men found that the most barren places of the barbarous north hid the treasure in unknown quantities in the ground 
that where neither tree nor shrub nor plant could flourish there they would be most likely to find it in the decaying beds of long-forgotten forests and so they began to dig down for what before they had only had to pick up although even in the palmy days the actual digging of the gum was looked upon by the respectable as rather a shady profession many a man got his start to commercial success that way and so long as money could be made fairly easily the decent settler would sometimes be found on the fields along with the adventurer and the pariah in the beginnings of the industry men were free to dig anywhere without licenses but as the possibilities of the trade were recognized the landowners both state and private began to demand their share of the pickings and with capitalization a good deal of the romance went out of the life as the years went on it became increasingly hard to make money grounds were gone over by succeeding droves of diggers who went deeper and deeper each time and who left less hope and fewer chances to those who followed when it came to the day that a bare existence was all that a man working for himself could expect to make the fields became more and more merely a refuge for the worthless and the hopeless and to say a man was a digger was to call him an outcast as well the simplicity of the outlay was one of the reasons why men of no resources took to the life all the tools needed were a probing spear a spade and a kit or sack the market was the nearest store unless a man was under contract to the owner of his field for his output he scraped the dirt off his gum or not as he pleased the store would take it either way but if he was thrifty which he seldom was he did his own scraping and got the higher price for living conditions he had the freest and cheapest thing in the world the problem of unearned increment never troubled him those privileges that men acquire as the perquisites of propinquity made no claims upon his gratitude he lived alone and rarely looked for company when he had staked out his claim on likely ground he hunted for the stream or spring that nature seldom denied him and chose the one as far away from anybody else as he could get there under skies often wet but otherwise amiable especially in the far north he made a dwelling after the finest traditions of simplicity either he put up a tent sometimes new or made a hut of sacks and mud and tea-tree or he built a nikau fare an art learned from the maoris out of the broad-leafed native palm for weeks perhaps he would not see a soul then driven by loneliness or the need for a fresh lot of food or the craving for whisky he would carry off the gum he had ready and go on the razzle-dazzle at the public house that every gum store ran as the sure getter of substantial profits if the owner was generous he did not let a digger drink all his money but set aside for him some of his old food stock against the day he should go home then when the rest of his earnings had disappeared in doubtful whisky the thoughtful capitalist turned him out to sober him up again in the days when men worked mostly for themselves it might be a long time before a man who did not turn up as usual at a store was missed he was likely to change his market once in a while seeking a more generous buyer or better food if he never turned up again no one but a pal who had taken a special interest in him would try to find out whether he was dead or had merely moved on to some other field it was this freedom that attracted the characters that have made the gum fields famous as a playground for the reckless and the damned of all the english derelict who have formed the majority of the floating population the man who professed to be related to nobility has always been the most familiar type the native-born colonial who affected to despise the ways of birth and breeding with some reason since he so often saw men of birth and breeding end their days in borrowed huts with no company but the wekas and the swamp rats had a habit of sarcastically dubbing every englishman who ever mentioned a title as the earl uttered always with a mock reverence and it was a common saying that there were more titled englishmen on the fields than ever came out of england the shades of suicide and murder have always stalked abroad upon the gummed lands whisky and the loneliness have brought many a man to the jump into the swamp or to a shot that no one heard or to the rarer use of the razor while the poaching of claims put a brand of cane upon most of those who killed under the open sky after a man had staked out a claim with the sticks that were often the only mark of occupation no one could steal a march upon him and work his ground until he removed the signs a break of this unwritten law was followed by swift vengeance settlers who have tried to reclaim old fields for cultivation have come every now and then upon a skeleton out in the open in the fern 
a skeleton nobody ever bothered to hide because there were a thousand chances to one against its ever being found and then if it had been found there was nobody interested enough to bother to suspect anybody of the deed if a digger found a body in the fern he would look to see that it was really dead and if so he left it and said nothing much of this ross knew as he followed asia and the stories he had heard peopled the shades around him with a grim company of the lost men and intensified his sense of the haunting melancholy of those open wastes that he felt rather than saw in the darkness around him he wished he could see more as they went but it took all his care to keep easily upon his feet as he dodged the treacherous remains of rotten stumps jumped the pygmy ravines that split the track and avoided other pitfalls of the narrow path that had been dangerously pocketed by the winter rains with holes that would break an unwary ankle on either side of the way he could see in the circle of light cast by the lantern that every inch of the ground had been turned by the spade some of it recently and asia told him that a field was like the widow's oil that men would poke about on much dug ground hoping that something had been missed by those who had gone before in places the pipe clay was so hard beneath their feet that the sound of their steps carried far into the night they passed small clumps of scraggy tea tree and went over rises that had not seemed half so high from the range above but the lack of real height and depth about them seemed to bring the glow of the milky way down about their ears on the low horizons the stars seemed to spring up at their feet and the zephyr that stirred the fern seemed to come clear from the heart of the universe they felt extraordinarily alone for not a living thing moved round them till they came to a swamp then there was suddenly a ghostly movement in the raupo and the reeds and something they could not see rose up and filled the night with a mysterious fluttering asia put the lantern under her dress and when they got their sight they saw the black specks against the stars swamp hens she said briefly as they watched as they went on again they smelt the rankness of the mud and the stagnant water a rankness that stung their nostrils long after they had left the cause of it behind them at last as they dipped down into a little gully they saw a blackness looming out ahead of them and soon afterwards the lantern showing the sack walls of a hut made on a tea-tree frame before they got to the doorway a horrid sound that made ross shudder was coughed out of the darkness at them good god he exclaimed what's that consumption the cough have you never heard it before don't come in if i want you i'll call you there is no reason why you should see it uncle david said he was pretty bad she spoke softly but he saw she was bracing herself to do what she had come to do as she went in he moved into the shaft of dim light that the lantern sent back into the heavy shadows the first thing he looked for inside was the figure on the low sacking stretcher over which asia leaned but he could see little of what lay beneath the dark blanket as the sound of another wrenching cough burst from the sick man ross remembered with a pang of fear that asia was breathing that poisoned air and for a moment he felt she was taking risks no dying man was worth then he was ashamed of himself but he was relieved to see that she took antiseptics out of her kit and used them liberally he looked curiously round the hut searching for something to show what manner of man had lived in it but for furniture there was only an empty box used as a table with a tin mug and some plates a pipe and tobacco and some stale bread upon it in the open zinc chimney there hung a suit of dungarees above the cold ashes of a fire that had not been lit for days a gum spear and a spade leaned against the sack wall there was a heap of clothes on the earth floor in one corner with a dirty copy of the auckland weekly news near it and the only other asset the sick man had was a small pile of unscraped gum not enough to buy him food for a week ross took it all in at a glance and with the realization of its misery he felt his throat turn hard and dry then he saw asia take out a little billy she had brought and some matches and with them in her hands she came out to him he saw her lips were set against a show of feeling ellen there's a spring quite near below us a little there's the path get some water and make a fire and warm it i must wash him wash him he repeated guessing what a revolting thing that would be i can't let him die dirty she said firmly even if i knew he would go in an hour i should wash him ross turned away from her seeing her through a mist and found his way by striking matches to the spring as he looked about for sticks and lit the fire 
which every colonial can make out of doors by instinct he exaggerated the simple operation into something that seemed to stand out as a landmark in his life as he sniffed the burning wood and looked up through the smoke into the stars he forgot the shadow of death hovering over the hut for he was full of the thought of life life and its wonders of love and romance when the water was warmed he carried it to the door asia was just finishing feeding the sick man with sips of broth waving ross back she came forward to take the water let me wash him he begged feeling that he could not bear to see her do it she looked eloquently at him but shook her head no you stay outside he has bad bed sores you wouldn't know how to do it i can manage i've done it before he went back to his little fire sitting so that he could look in at her he knew by the expression of her face as he watched her work mostly underneath the blanket that it was a sickening job but he guessed she did not shirk one bit of it she stopped twice to help the poor wretch over fits of coughing and when she had finished washing him she worked an old sheet over him and bathed his body again with alcohol then as he lay in comparative comfort for a few minutes the digger's lips moved ross could not hear what he said but he saw alice move the things off the box take something out of her kit and sit down beside him and then he heard the first words of the fourteenth chapter of st john skeptic and socialist though he was he could not hear them without emotion he had never tried to minimize their value to large numbers of the human race but never since his childhood had they meant anything to him but as asia picked out the most comforting verses in the fourteenth and fifteenth chapters and read them as he was sure they had never been read before he felt that the spirit of them was the spirit that had saved and always would save humanity from itself the spirit of the reformer the dreamer and the idealist as asia closed with the verse i will not leave you comfortless i will come to you she seemed to ross as she sat in her white dress her golden head a little bowed to be indeed the spirit of christ come to cheer the dying man into the unknown future a mist covered his eyes as he saw her kneel down and heard her pray a simple little prayer that god would comfort the dying man and forgive him and give him rest setting his teeth he got up and walked away along the path he had always known that he could not play with her he had never wanted to so far he had not allowed himself to come to a full expression of his love for her feeling that if he once began he would have to abide for ever by the choice and realizing that divorce at the outset of a political career even in the tolerant colonies was something of a handicap and then it was by no means certain that he could get the divorce but whether or no he cared not now as he looked up at the stars for she was finally bound to his soul with hoops of steel he was so full of his own thoughts that he did not hear the further fits of coughing in the tent he was in the grip of a sweep onward that had carried him away into the future to visions of obstacles overcome and victories won he started when he heard his own name come to him out of the night walking back he saw asia poking something into the fire and he saw that she had changed her dress for something dark the lantern and the kit were on the ground near her yes he asked he's dead she said her voice breaking dead he repeated stupidly yes that last fit of coughing they often go like that poor thing but oh it's a blessing he might have lingered for weeks her voice ended in a sob something twisted ross's throat so that he could not speak he saw mechanically that she was burning her white dress what are you doing he asked hoarsely because he could think of nothing else to say i have to burn up everything that i can she answered forcing calmness into her voice turning from her he took up the lantern and walked into the hut to look upon the dead digger who now lay wrapped in a sheet his eyes closed it was hard to tell what kind of a man he had been for prolonged dying had taken all the distinctiveness out of him there was no meaning in his gray face he was simply skin and bone ross had never seen a dead thing that was so inexpressive of anything but naked misery he moved away from it with a groan just outside the hut door he saw a heap of the box the blanket the dead man's clothes asia had emptied all of her antiseptics over them with his foot ross moved them down to the fire it was mostly in silence that they burned everything that could hold the fraction of a germ when they had finished there was not a thing left in the hut but the sheeted corpse on its stretcher the tin vessels the spade and the spear and they had nothing to carry back with them but the lantern and the matches 
what happens to him now asked ross when they had stamped out the fire we report his death to harold brayton he's the coroner uncle david will give the certificate they may come to see the body or they may not our word is enough and the pater will send men to bury him somewhere here in the fern he never got any letters no one knew who he was he's lost that's all her tone was a damning indictment of something and somebody ross gripped her arm come away he commanded we have done all we can for god's sake let's get away from it their tongues loosened as they walked and the impatient anger of their youth and strength vented itself upon the institutions of ages to them the pitiful end of the dead man was a synonym for the failure of civilization it represented waste cruelty and disorganization stupidity and indifference they talked of the awakening of humanity through the teachings of socialism of the hopelessness of established systems of the great future before the labor party of new south wales and that brought them to themselves and the part that ross and through him the part that she too would play in it and the great thing now to both of them as they retraced their steps was that they were made of the same mind as to how the world was to be remade by the time they had reached the ridge above the river it was long after midnight their passion for the regeneration of mankind had worn itself out for the time being and they stopped to look at a late moon of smoky gold that rose from the black shades of pukikaroro it was a natural that looking together at her they should forget the failure of civilization they had not stood a minute before the realization of their own youth and nearness and common desires obliterated the troubles of the rest of the world from their minds they were caught by a conspiracy in themselves acting in concert with the time and the place asia dropped the lantern and it went out she did not stoop to pick it up because ross's arm swept round her pinning her helpless against him god i love you you beautiful thing he cried and so they too for a time under the midnight stars forgot the dead man in the hut End of chapter 26